And yet, I'm still in favor of the death penalty. I think of Adolf Eichmann having murdered millions of Jews. I think of, of um, Timothy McVeigh uh, killing those innocent children in retaliation for Waco. And I think of the, the doctor and his family, family who were, were, were murdered in Connecticut. And I think of those, and I, I guess I think that maybe, maybe society should make a moral statement that this, this type of conduct uh, is the worst conduct and deveres, de deserves the, the most severe sanction. However, it isn't because I haven't thought about it uh, quite often over the years. Um, <clears throat> and I, I think of that, too, in the context of the military, when I think of the slaughter of ind perfectly innocent people, like the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam, and the slaughter of so many soldiers by <clears throat> uh, who were captured in in uh, in the Pacific and uh, by Japanese and slaughter of, of uh, American soldiers in France by the Nazi soldiers and I think that these people do deserve uh, the severest penalty. However, over the years I've I've thought about it. I I came back from the service and I started uh, working for the Montgomery County Prosecutor's Office where I served for 15 years, uh, 13 of them as the first assistant county prosecutor, charged with prosecuting uh, the major homicide cases. I prosecuted seven death cases, uh, death penalty cases. They were all set aside first by the Supreme Court in 1972 as a result of Furman versus Georgia, and then later <clears throat> by, by the 1978 case of Lockett versus Ohio. After that, I went on the Ohio, Ohio Court of Appeals, uh, where I served for, for 30 years. Uh, and our task, at least for two-thirds of my time on the Court of Appeals, was to review death penalty cases. Uh, there were death penalty cases that I reversed. Um, <clears throat> I have, for many years, taught at the University of Dayton Law School criminal procedure. I know how the system works. I know how police officers investigate cases well or not so well. I have a pretty good feel for <clears throat> who deserves the worst of our uh, penalty, the death penalty. And it isn't what currently exists. But before I get to that, I guess I should tell you how I got to be the chair of the Supreme Court Task Force to review the administration of Ohio's death penalty. Well, uh, some years ago, the, the American Bar Association uh, responded to a number of exonerations that were occurring as a result of the discovery of DNA. At least in cases where biological evidence was found, they actually exonerated people. For instance, in rape murder cases that, where the individual received the death penalty and where he claimed his innocence and where DNA, eventually through the Innocence Project, in the early 1990s proved that these people who were sitting on death row in isolation for many years were actually innocent. <clears throat> and as a result of that, a, a number of exonerations occurred in the 1990s. One occurred in late, uh, in 2000, in Illinois, where most of the, where 18 exonerations had occurred. One of them involved a man by the name of Anthony Porter, who had been identified by two other individuals who lived in the projects as he being the murderer. He protested his innocence. Young students at Northwestern University in the journalism department began an investigation of Porter's claim he was innocent. And it discovered that, in fact, Porter did not commit the crime. And they discovered who did, a man in Milwaukee who admitted to the crime. Within 40, came, the admission came within 48 hours of Porter being executed. Governor Ryan in Illinois was so shaken by the fact that within 48 hours, a man would be executed for a crime he did not commit, <clears throat> that he immediately put a moratorium on the death penalty in Illinois and then appointed a commission to investigate <clears throat> the, how the death penalty was administered in Illinois. At the conclusion of their report, they concluded there were a number of failures, cracks in the system, so to speak. In other words, what they were trying to find out 
what common denominator existed in these prosecutions that would result in a wrong result, in a wrongful conviction? What contributes to wrongful convictions? What are the, what's the common denominator that, that they found in these cases? And so the commission made certain recommendations to the Illinois legislature. The Illinois legislature was about to make the recommendations when in fact <clears throat> they decided to reverse themselves and find that the system could not work appropriately and they did away with the death penalty. Now there have been commissions in other states uh, that have investigated the foibles of the death penalty system, where are the failures, where, where are the cracks in the system that allow for perhaps a wrongful conviction. And in New Jersey, the commission came up with recommendations like we have. We came up with, we came up with 56. But New Jersey legislature was so chagrined by the results of the investigation, they did away with the death penalty. Maryland did the same investigation, came up with the same recommendations that the American Bar Association had recommended. They then concluded, as Justice Stevens did, of the retired Supreme Court justice, that the death penalty system cannot be fixed. And therefore, they did away with the death penalty. Connecticut did the same thing. We are, in the, in the, at the conclusion of two years of our work, we have been asked to look at an ABA study. The ABA said, started to look into seven states that they believed needed to be examined for the potential that their death penalty system might in fact create a wrong result. In fact, six people in Ohio have been exonerated from death row. Ohio is not nearly as bad as many other states in which there have been far more exonerations. But the point of it is, can you imagine a man sitting on death row 23 hours a day, one hour in a small cell, knowing he's innocent? It's almost like Les Miserables having gone to jail for what that man went for. Knowing you're innocent and the system hasn't detected it and you're about to be executed. Surely there have been people who have been executed who were innocent. We don't know how many. We do know that 143 people have been exonerated from this. And, and we've tried to look in to what those problems are. Now, after this recommendation was made by the, Ohio, by the American Bar Association, they recommended that we form a committee to investigate how, the Ohio, how Ohio imposes the death penalty. And so the Chief Justice, Chief Justice uh, Moyer asked me some time ago if I would chair the committee. I don't know why he selected me. I'd been a judge for many years. I'd prosecuted death cases. I taught criminal procedure. But I wasn't a Supreme Court justice. I was just a, a judge on the Court of Appeals. But he asked me to do it. But before I could do, Tom died. J Chief Justice Moyer died. And the thing went kind of quiet for a while. But when Chief Justice O'Connor took over, she wanted it to, to be rejuvenated. She wanted this to be looked into. And so uh, she appointed a committee. And that committee essentially were 22 people who met every two months to make recommendations uh, to address these problems that, that we were talking, that I was talking about. And some of these, the people who were selected to serve on this committee are the following. And I, I, the reason I bring this up is I wanted to make this point at least tonight. <clears throat> there is a dissenting report that was made by prosecutors to our recommendation. It has not been formally published, but it's a matter of public record and people have seen it. And the prosecutors have not, are not, not in favor of many of the recommendations that we made to make the system more fair. Uh, and the prosecutors say, in several of the recommendations, the task force, these 22 members of which I was the chair, veered off its narrow mandate. And in making recommendations, they are anti-death penalty. The work of the task force was strongly influenced by a pro-defense majority bent on an agenda at abolition and fairness. Now, the Chief Justice told us in the beginning that our charge was to review the fairness of how the death penalty is administered. 
we were not to consider or recommend whether to abolish the death penalty. We were not to impose or suggest that a moratorium be imposed while we were doing our study. That was never discussed by our commission. And the, and the 56 recommendations that were made by many of the members, the majority members, they came from a group that I will, t uh, I will explain to you some facts. The facts are that this committee was not stacked in favor of the defense. In fact, there were eight judges, four legislators, six prosecutors, two academics, and three defense lawyers. So to suggest that this was a stacked committee as a pro-defense is simply belied by the numbers. In fact, one prosecutor wanted to, to come in on our committee. He was not originally on the committee when there was much criticism of how the death penalty is uh, executed in Cuyahoga County. He asked me for permission, and I asked the Chief Justice, and he was added. So we added a prosecutor. We had a prosecutor who had to step down because um, he had an illness in the family, and he was substituted. We had somebody who was one of the hot, best lawyers in Ohio, Sam Porter, a Porter Wright in Columbus, who died during our, our uh, deliberations, and he was not replaced. So to suggest that this committee was rigged, or somehow was rigged in favor of the defense, is simply not true. It may be that many of these recommendations were simply made by judges who were, after all, trained not to favor prosecution or defense, but to be impartial. And these, so these recommendations that we've made, we think, are quite important. But let me tell you, how is it that I want to give you some, some idea of where the fault lines are. And uh, I think I had it in here somewhere. Uh, yes, this Northwestern study on wrongful convictions concluded that uh, these wrongful convictions resulted from eyewitness error. <laughs> Sometimes people are sure that the person is the, uh, who they say they are, and they're simply wrong. Not they are not intentionally wrong, they were simply their psychological influences that impact the identification. And, and the police can contribute to that either consciously or, or unconsciously. And so, uh, misidentifications. Uh, recently, a man was released after 31 years in Missouri as innocent, and he had been identified as being the killer. Now, in this case, another case is snitch testimony. A snitch is somebody in jail who wants to offer evidence that the defendant confessed while he was incarcerated, and he wants to come forward. No self-respecting prosecutor would offer a snitch as testimony in any case, let alone a death case. They are simply unreliable. They would sell their mother if they could get out of jail, and certainly they would do so in, in a death case. In terms of government misconduct, unfortunately, in Illinois, they discovered that a lot of police were lying. A lot of police were hiding evidence, and in fact, they, in many of these cases, they claim the defendant confessed. Yet none of these confessions were either audio or videotaped. And so you, have, you sometimes have prosecutor, prosecutorial misconduct. Now, one of our recommendations we made was that whatever is in the prosecutor's file ought to be in the defense file. Whatever we know about this case, they should know about this case because the prosecutor has all the advantages. I spent 15 years prosecuting cases, I can tell you. We have the cops, people like cops. We have the investigators, they can do all the work. We have the public who want to put bad people in jail. We have a lot of, of things going for us. So when an innocent man is on trial, he is facing, or she is facing, the system that seems to favor the prosecution. A defense lawyer gets hired to defend and appointed and paid a pittance. He has to find an investigator to help him. So I, we recommended, our committee recommended, make sure that anything the police have found as a result of their investigation should be turned over to the defense so that everybody's on an equal plane. 
And one thing they should turn over to the defense is who is your other suspect, if you have one? Because in Anthony Porter's case, the man in Milwaukee was the other suspect that the Chicago police knew about all the time. And so th that's something we made a recommendation. For false confessions, I don't know if any of, uh, any of you got to see uh, the, the um, um, PBS broadcast on the, on the Central Park Five, uh, but George Will, a noted conservative, wrote about the Central Park Five. <clears throat> this, George writes this, there were abundant dystopian aspects of New York City in the 1980s when crime, crack, and AIDS produced a perfect storm of anxiety about the fraying social fabric. This was the context, a city on edge, when on April 19, 1989, a 28-year-old white woman who worked on Wall Street went for a jog after dark in Central Park. She became a victim of what was immediately called wilding, a word primarily unknown by the four blacks and one Hispanic, aged 14 to 16, who were arrested and charged with raping her and beating her nearly to death. After up to, uh, after up to 30 hours of separate interrogation by detectives who are paid to be suspicious of suspects, four of the five young men confessed to a crime they did not commit. Why? Watch this documentary by Ken Burns. To see the old videotape of the interrogation is to understand the dynamic that sent the five to prison despite the absence of evidence to bolster a rickety case that consisted entirely of these confessions. One of the five recalls his interrogation. They pulled my father aside. Then my father came back in the room. It was like he just changed. He was like, listen. He was like, tell these people what they want to hear so we can go home. If he just, if he, if he just withstood his ground, I would have told the truth. I would have stuck to the truth. In any event, of course, they determined that these boys, after 11 years in jail, did not commit that offense. They discovered the, the real person, and the DNA proved that he was the guy who raped them. A single person, not these five boys, some who couldn't even speak English. And so what I proposed, and our committee proposed, is that confessions ought to be video or, video or audio taped in a death penalty prosecution, and if not, they are to be resumed involuntary. In Illinois and in 15 states in the District of Columbia, no confession in a death case is admissible unless it is audio or videotaped. Do you know that 90% of the smartphones have an audio and video capability? There is no excuse for a police officer in, in interrogating a suspect would not video or audio tape. What they do is they interrogate them for hours and then they videotape them. <clears throat> and so we have made that recommendation. We've also rec tried to recommend what, why do we have such a geographic disparity in Ohio between who gets subjected to the death penalty. In 46 counties of the state since 1981 when the death penalty was reinstated, no, no county prosecutor has sought the death penalty. And in only 2% of our, our, our state has the death penalty been pursued. In Cuyahoga County, there was as many as, 11, or 11, many as 365 indictments over a 10-year period for the death penalty. In Cincinnati, a city of equal size, there was only 52. Now, the, the state of Ohio is one geographic place. It shouldn't differ that you're subjected to the death penalty whether you live in Cincinnati or you live in Columbus or you live in Cleveland. And so we recommended that there be a central committee of prosecutors and maybe some academics uh, who would, who would uh, or the AG, the Attorney General and the prosecutors, retired prosecutors who would look at this and say, yes, this is a death penalty case and to pursue it. And we made an, uh, a number of other recommendations. For instance, race. Four times as many people get the death penalty if the, if the defendant killed a white victim. Four times, whether they're black or white as, a, as the killer. If you're white as a victim, you're going to have the death penalty uh, in that case as opposed to a black person. We should not, we should not distribute justice based on race. 
And the system has demonstrated that over the years, and we need to examine that. Right now, we don't compare. Uh, for instance, uh, th there was a very interesting uh, article, and I I'll finish up real quick, but, but uh, I wanted to, to uh, read to you something that Jim, Jim Petro and his wife wrote. Jim Petro, if you remember, was a Republican Attorney General. Jim Petro and Nancy, his wife, decided that they had heard enough of these innocent cases where people were nearly received the death penalty. So they began an investigation, and they represented actually a man who was wrongfully convicted in Akron of a murder, uh, and he, they got them freed through the Innocence Project. But here's what Jim wrote in a recent book he wrote with Nancy. Remember, this is the former Attorney General of the State of Ohio and candidate for governor. Innocent people in prison number in the thousands. Because they have been misidentified by a witness, or because a snitch saw an opportunity to approve his or her situation, or because they confessed in order to bargain for a better sentence, or because they were psychologically beaten down, or were a juvenile, or were a of diminished cognitive capacity, or because they pled to a lesser crime rather than gamble away most of their lives with a jury, or because a past mistake put them on a permanent list of go-to suspects, or because they had a worthless lawyer, or even just one who was overly busy or underpaid, or because they drew a county prosecutor who was particularly rigid or arrogant or superficial or up for re-election, or because a forensic scientist was lazy or incompetent or fudged his numbers to help make the case. Part of our recommendations was to at least make all of the forensic labs who do the forensic investigations be certified, for God's sake, that they, they, we don't get junk science introduced into these cases. Um, and uh, in terms of lawyers, in Champaign County, the most you can pay a, a lawyer, appointed lawyer on a death penalty case is $5,000. Go over a few miles to Montgomery County, it's $75,000. Now, does your, does your right to representation depend on 25 miles? It should not. And these are the things that we've addressed. Now, one of the things I simply want to say uh, is that uh, I guess I may be where Justice, Justice Stevens was or is. Uh, Justice John Paul Stevens, who you may know, served on the Supreme Court of Ohio, or the Supreme Court of the United States. And he said, Finally, given the real risk of error in this class of cases, the irrevocable nature of the consequences is of decisive importance to me. Whether or not any innocent defendants have actually been executed, abundant evidence accumulated in recent years has resulted in the exoneration of an unacceptable number of defendants found guilty of capital offenses. <clears throat> and uh, he said, I have relied on my own experience in reaching the conclusion that the imposition of the death penalty represents the pointless and needless extension, extinction of life with only marginal contributions to any discernible social or public purpose. Now, with Justice, uh, Justice Stevens, uh, a wonderful justice on the Supreme Court, uh, and originally a conservative justice, was he was very concerned that the system isn't fair, and can the system be fixed? I'm in the position of, of being on a committee that has recommended changes in our system to make it fair, to prevent the execution of an innocent person. Now, the legislature may ignore it. They may never have any hearings on it. I ask you simply to ask the legislature, please let us have a hearing on, on these recommendations. Consider them because we spent two years to make sure that the system is fair. And the last thing we want anybody ever to participate, I would never want to participate in a system that would convict an innocent person. And with that, um, thank you very much for listening to us.